at some point in your path, you've become so much a friend of God, a friend of Jesus, that you value that friendship so much that your life is worth sacrificing for it. Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and I'm blessed to be here with you. And I'm also blessed, and we're blessed to be here with Simone Riscala from Endow. Simone, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here with you. I was recently blessed to hear from Simone at an Endow conference, and I was so touched by your charism and your passion, your intellect, your beauty. You are just a lovely woman of faith, and I am delighted to share you with listeners at Mamas in Spirit. Oh, thank you so much, Lindy. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> and like with everything, let us begin in prayer. Dearest God, thank you. Thank you for this season of Advent that reminds each one of us that we are waiting in joyful hope. We are waiting in joyful hope to be in full and complete communion with you, Lord. And just like the star that the Magi followed, you are the light. You are the one. You are the star. Help us to follow you, Lord. Help us to abide deeply in your Holy Spirit and to remember Emmanuel, God with us, that you are with us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Simone, this is the season of Advent. This is such a special and sacred time as a church. And something struck me so deeply the day that you shared at the Endow Conference. And I want to read the quote that you said because I wrote it down as you said it. In the Middle East, you know if you are Christian because you are either willing to die or not. And Simone, her family, her parents, her heritage is from Egypt. And I think about Advent and I think about Jesus and Mary leaving everything that they knew and everything that was safe and home to them to live and to be able to birth Jesus in safety. And I think that that ties so deeply into your story and your family story and your passionate faith. So I would love for you to share some about that. I would love to share that. Asking someone to tell their story is very personal, but it's a huge desire to be acknowledged, to be recognized. Everybody has a story. So I'm grateful to share mine and I'm a little, not embarrassed, but it's so personal and I'm bringing in to that story a lot of people. It took a lot of people for me to be where I am today in the United States. And sometimes when I share my story or bits of it in different forums, my parents will say, why do you have to mention that we're Middle Eastern? Because it's a very American thing to be able to be so evangelical with your faith because we enjoy so much freedom. So there's still in the psyche of my parents, be careful about sharing because that culture of being free, to be verbally free, to testify to Jesus, it's a distinctly free country, American, Western kind of thing. It's not an Eastern kind of thing. If you go to Voice of the Martyrs or Open Doors and you look for their persecution maps, You might be stunned to see that the majority of the world, to varying degrees, don't really enjoy religious freedom. The Christian experience of most Christians is not the indulgent, free one that we get to enjoy here in the United States. And so I just wanted to share that having that perspective kind of sharpens the urgency for me to really embrace and enjoy every gift of freedom, every religious expression that I'm able to share with others in this country. So I begin that way just because I can hear my parents (laughs) say, why are you talking about this? Because it was scary for them to be able to express their faith, which was one of the reasons why my dad went to Lebanon first as a teenager and was considered a refugee. And the, the church, the Catholic Church, the Armenian Catholic Church helped him get the right papers, the right legal papers to be able to come to the United States. And then later on, my mom joined him. So the whole reason that we're in the United States at all is because there was this growing tension 
that it wasn't going to be a safe place, not just treated as second class citizens. They were made fun of. And sometimes you get you know, on the street, you have a little brawl and get your cross ripped off of you, things like that. But those things never stay those things. They escalate later on. And everything that we're seeing now with ISIS and Syria and all of those terrible things that are finally now in the news, that was the prophecy prediction and the pending reality that my parents were living in, which prompted them to come to the United States. So all that being said, my story begins with that in my psyche. And psychologists now will say there's trauma DNA, but it's very much true because for the last century, there's been the Armenians in my family who had to leave Armenia because of the genocide and then coming to Egypt and enjoying some freedoms there for a while, knowing that that was going to be short-lived and then coming to the United States. So as a little kid, if you've seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding, <laughs> that's a little bit, a lot actually of the, of the cultural experience, but also that awareness that the faith that I was given was something that ought not be taken for granted. I spent this past summer in Poland, and I was blessed enough to study under George Weigel. And he said that when John Paul II, who fought so hard against socialism and communism and the right to be religiously free, when the downfall of communism in large part happened in Eastern Europe, the thing that he wasn't prepared for, the thing that even he, one of the greatest prophets of the 20th century, didn't expect was that once people were given freedom, that they didn't know what to do with that freedom. So what was helpful for me to hear that from George about Pope John Paul II, because it explained my confused experience as a young adult. Being in the United States, seeing that everybody could go to Mass without worrying about it, could pray the rosary without worrying about it, could do Eucharistic processions in the streets without worrying about it, but then there was not that same love, vigor, urgency, intensity, and so forth. So that was a little bit baffling to me. And sad. It was pretty sad because consumerism, and I grew up in California, so that was always going to be a thing. But it was pretty sad for me to see people who were so called Christians, but did not really have this urgency for the faith that was so much characterizes Christians in persecuted territories. So that quotation that you mentioned that struck you during the talk, it struck me when I first heard it because it really is kind of a drawing a line in the sand. At some point in your path, you've become so much a friend of God, a friend of Jesus, that you value that friendship so much that your life is worth sacrificing for it. And I think that even if you're not quite there yet, at some point, it comes down to that. I so appreciate what you're saying, Simone, about at some point in our lives and in our journeys and on our paths, our pilgrimages, that we become so close with Christ that we're willing to sacrifice our lives for that love of Christ and because of the intimacy of that relationship. And I witness in you your willingness to do that even in the face of what you deem your trauma DNA. And thank you so much for sharing with us the story of your family. It's deeply touching. And you witness to God and witness to your faith in many ways that you share freely with others. You have your blog, Cultural Gypsy at culturalgypsy.com, which I encourage everyone to check out, and also through Endow, Educating on the Nature and Dignity of Women, which provides resources for small groups, for women to gather. So even though you have found that in America and your family has found in America that there are not these same tight-knit communities But yet here you are engaging in this program to help bring that here and to help women to be able to find that. So how have you grown to truly know Christ deeply and personally in your own life, living in the state of this dichotomy per se, that you are blessed with this profound gift of faith from your family, yet in America, it's been a much lonelier road and it's not as tight-knit of a community. You haven't experienced that great gift that your parents had. So how have you discovered God and come to embody this deeply personal relationship? My conversion or reversion or true conversion, deeper reversion, adult conversion was somewhat parallel to 
the renewal in our family. We started to renew and refresh our relationship with the saints because it was so strong and so taken for granted in the Middle East. You have to work really hard, I guess is what I'm saying, as an American Catholic, to keep up those cultural things that come so easily when you're in tight-knit communities. So I found this prayer by St. Ambrose, and I knew that this prayer was going to be one of the beginnings of the answer to the question of my life. And the prayer goes like this. Teach me, O Lord, to search for you. Show yourself to me when I search for you. If you do not teach me first, I cannot seek you. If you do not reveal yourself to me, I cannot find you. In longing, may I search for you, and in searching, long for you. In love, may I find you, and in finding you, love you. And I read that, and I thought, this is it. If anything's going to happen with me and God, it's going to have to be on his initiative. He's the protagonist. He's going to have to reach out to me. All I can do is ask. And I was so happy that I found this prayer. And so that was an encounter with St. Ambrose. Another encounter was at SCRC, which is a charismatic conference that happens in Southern California. So this woman named Babsy Bleasdale, which some people probably know who she is, especially if you're in the charismatic renewal. And she is this African lady. I think she's from Zimbabwe. And she's just glowing with the Holy Spirit. But Babsy was just holding my hand, just kind of like kind of petting me, just, I guess, loving me. She went, okay, dear. You know, she's just a beautiful, booming African voice. She goes, okay, dear, you pray to the Holy Spirit. You pray these prayers to the Holy Spirit every day, and your life is going to be okay. And I was like, okay. this woman tells me to do it. I'm going to do it. So she gave me three prayers to the Holy Spirit that I have prayed every single day. So there was St. Ambrose, Babsy, and these Holy Spirit prayers that I was very convicted of. And another huge, huge thing happened was that I went to the Witherspoon Fellowship, which is now the John Jay Institute. And that is really the first time in my life, apart from my sister and my one Lebanese Catholic best friend from high school, (laughs) that I met other young people who cared about Jesus. And they were from all different denominations. I mean, they they were Quakers in the group. But for me, it was a huge encounter because I had never really seen young people from all over the country who were young, who were passionate, who would stay up and have theological debate and talk and we cared and we wanted to restore culture and we wanted to find our vocations and we we wanted all these things. And I came home and there were so many people who cared for me and who answered my questions, who witnessed to me by their lives and you're just here and there that they were planted. And at a certain point, I had read and learned enough that I had been intellectually converted to the faith, had recognized that it was the church that Jesus founded. So what was I going to do? Well, I prayed and said, look, God, listen here, Lord, you've got to send me people. The human heart, this thing is not an alone thing. This is, this is not an isolated thing. This is a communal thing. So... There was kind of the isolation. Many Americans feel loneliness and isolation in American life of being very fragmented. We're a very fragmented culture. Our structures, our work are not set up for community. We have to work really hard for it. And at a certain point, we met Catholic Charismatic Renewal in Southern California, who were happy, lovely families and people who knew the faith. That was something that I really, I needed to see. I needed to see happy Christian families and people, authentic. And then I met Communion and Liberation, which is an ecclesial movement that churches started in Italy. And that is where I have really found my spiritual home in many ways. And where I would say that I was given not only the witness, but also the way to articulate it. At a certain point, I thought, well, what do these people want out of me? Do they want a membership card? What do they want? (laughs) What do they want from me? But the answer is nothing. Nothing. Similar to God. And the way that they looked at me, their gaze upon my life, their love for my life, their unconditional love for my life, you don't really forget that. 
till this day, the thing that I return to is the gaze. I love how you talk about their gaze. That's such a beautiful sentiment and it's so deeply intimate and personal, just like Christ's love for us, which they were witnessing to you. And it is a significant reminder to us that even though in certain places and locations, countries in life, that we may need to seek more intensely or be more intentional to be rooted in communities of faith, that God is everywhere. God is always with us, Emmanuel. And what a beautiful reminder during this time of Advent. And I love your story and I love how you start with your parents before you ever were and how their decisions and their choice to follow Christ and their choice to find safety. And I'm so deeply moved by your mother. I want to meet your mom one day because I can understand and I feel for her when she says, why do you need to share that, Simone? Why do you need to share that? You need to be safe because that's her reality. That's her lived experience. She experienced persecution to the point of possible death. She had to make a choice and your dad had to make a choice that was a critical choice. And you've compared that to modern day America and to other countries and to the Middle East and this freedom that we often take for granted and this freedom to worship and this freedom to love God and to talk about God. And even in America, we get persecuted. And even in America, it doesn't always feel safe or comfortable. So when I think about your mom and as a mother and you being her daughter and that lived experience, it ties so deeply into Advent and Mary and Joseph and their journey and their journey to safety. And I appreciate that because like you're saying, hearing stories like this are really helpful because while we can use our imaginations and God's blessed us with imagination and that can help to bring things to a deeper understanding, hearing someone else's story and their true lived experience, that can be a profound experience. So thank you to you for sharing that. And thank you to your parents for their lived testimony and their openness to that and their encouragement of you in your faith and your call. So I think about that And then I think about how you're then blessed to be here in America and how you have said this, yes, Simone, that must delight your mother's heart that your yes to God, your own fiat to God, because we stand upon the shoulders of those who've gone before us and you stand upon the shoulders and you lie deeply within your mother's heart. And so to think about her hopes and dreams and her hopes and dreams coming to America, even though that's not necessarily what she probably would have chosen. I'm sure she would have loved to have been safe and worshiping God in her tight-knit community in her home of origin. Because like you said, America can be very, very lonely. It can be very, very difficult. And I was just talking with Herman Valoria from the Simple Living Podcast. He is an amazing, profound man of faith. He's from Colombia and he's moving back to Colombia. I spent some time living in a very poor Pueblo outside of Tijuana in Mexico. And I said to him, that's the closest that I've ever really felt to God in some ways and in the sense of community. Because when you don't have much and we don't have basic needs or safety, the things at the very bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, things like basic needs, safety, and security, when we don't have those things, it's real. Life is so real. Life and death is so real. Survival or not survival is so real. What really matters and the gift of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit is so real real. And so I imagine your mom misses living in a community like that, unless she's been able to reestablish something here in America. You're absolutely right. All of the generation of my parents, they really miss the community in the Middle East. You, you hit the nail on the head. They're only here because of the need for safety and prosperity and not at all for any other reason. So they're so grateful, but also wish that the circumstances there were different. They feel sorry for us. The fragmentation is real and they feel bad for our generation. They're like, you do you do not have what we have. I so appreciate that and, and that almost makes me teary because I think I wanna have what they had. I long for 
what they had and they experienced that and they know what that is. And it's not that I haven't experienced that in touchdowns in my life or within the intimacy of my own immediate family, but I definitely long for that deep sense of community and belonging on a wider scale, on a community level. Right. Yep. And to think about this time of Advent and Mary and Joseph leaving all of that, everyone they knew. And that kind of ties in to another part of Advent that I really love with Mary and Elizabeth. When the angel comes to Mary, the angel talks about Elizabeth as well. And I think that's so poignant and so important because while this is going to be a very lonely journey and a very difficult journey and one of great risk, God also says Elizabeth is also going to be pregnant. Baron Elizabeth, older Elizabeth, is going to be pregnant at the same time. And then there's this beautiful passage about the meeting of Elizabeth and Mary. But I think about that and I think about Mary being blessed with Elizabeth and with this great sisterhood in Christ and sisterhood in the Holy Spirit. And that's essentially now in your life, one of your greatest callings and a fruition of your family's choices and your great yes is now you're with endowed, which hopes to bring women together in this example, this great example, like Mary and Elizabeth in these small communities these opportunities to walk and to pilgrimage, to journey with one another as women in a deep and meaningful way. Mm, That's so beautiful. I hadn't really reflected on Mary and Elizabeth in relationship to the work of Endow, but that's exactly it. It's such a huge privilege working with Endow. It is stunning that the thing that we crave the most, which is to be connected to other human beings, and that we actually can't even understand ourselves outside of a relationship with another person. One of the most quoted lines of John Paul II is from Gaudium et Spes, where he says, man finds himself only an authentic gift of self. So I can't even begin to understand who I am. I actually am not who I am without you, without the other. And the thing that we crave the most seems to be the most difficult thing to have. To have community, authentic community, it's the simplest need, one of the most basic human desires, and it's so difficult to have. So working with Endow, it's really a privilege because, well, one, my story is such that I am in the church today because of community, because of communities and the power and the strength of that, but that we so much need to be reminded over and over and over again, especially since we can't take the culture for granted to remind us. The need for things like Endow would be so much less if the culture that we were in was just a communal culture that spoke truths about our humanity and about God to it. But it's not the reality. And so the point is, is that my education about my value, my dignity, first given to me very strongly by my mother, (laughs) in a very forceful Middle Eastern way. But it's so beautiful to see and to help facilitate these small group communities of women where it's a place of belonging, a space for my humanity, a space for encounter with the Lord, because it's not just a country club of women, right? It's not just hanging out. It's centered around the presence of the Holy Spirit that comes through the inheritance of the truths that the women are learning through the study guides. It is profoundly beautiful. I'm doing a study right now, Letter to Women, and it is a sacred experience. It's just a really touching and beautiful experience. So I want to thank you and everyone at Endow for that and everything you're doing because like you've pointed upon, Simone, when we're encouraged by one person, just one. You talked about Bagsby and you talked about others as well. That can be life transforming. And we're called to be open to that in our hearts and to seek God, much like your St. Ambrose prayer, to always be seeking and searching for God every day of our lives and then also to be sharing God. And thank you for sharing. Your story is the one of seeking and seeking at the deepest of levels, integrating every part of yourself into this great faith that you have. So I want to thank you for your beautiful testimony and who you are. I have told you when we connected about doing this podcast, the most beautiful gifts about doing Mamas in Spirit is that 
I'm blessed to spend time with and have these holy moments with these profound people of faith. And Mm -hmm. it's transformative. I just feel so blessed upon that. So thank you so much, Simone. So glad. And thank you for mentioning the sharing element because we're in such, and I try not to lose my peace over this, but it's a battle. We're in such a crisis and such a need to reach out to people and bring them in. So we also need to receive in our communities and our small groups, but we also need to just be attentive to the Simones or other people out there who really needed to be brought in and to bring them in if that's what you're called to do. And women are just, this is just the feminine genius, right? We kind of perceive and intuit the needs and know what's going on behind what seems to be going on and fill that. So if we can just equip an army of women out there, I'll be happy. An army of women for the Lord with those pastoral gifts to do everything that we do and love and to share that love. Thank you so much, Simone. And how can people get a hold of you and of Endow? So if you're interested in learning more about Endow or maybe starting a group or finding a group, shoot me an email. I have a personal email, but my last name is really long in Middle Eastern. So <laughs> just email info at endowgroups.org. I'll get that. <laughs> and I would love to talk to you about potentially starting a small group. Another thing that coming on board with Endow that I'm really looking forward to doing, and it's starting to happen already, is the women have been contacting me saying, got theological questions or pastoral questions. And I just love being able to point people out to the right resources, books, articles. There's so much in the church. There's so many spiritual treasures. So if you have any kind of pastoral, spiritual, theological question or inquiry, regardless of starting or joining a group, I would love to be a resource for you. Wonderful. And you're doing an Advent series. Yes, doing an Advent series based on this book. This is a beautiful little book. I don't think it's very well known, but it should be because Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, when he was a priest in Germany, he gave three Advent homilies to a Catholic student chaplaincy. And these are just treasures. If you are listening and feel that you can't articulate the faith or you're just confused about what the faith really is, This book will help. It's almost like a psychology book because he not only talks about spiritual things, but even person's struggles, sins, temptations. Ratzinger really confronts it. And if you've never read Ratzinger, if you've never read Pope Benedict, you will feel like you know him after reading this. He is such a beautiful, truly human person who struggle with all of the same things. And you know it because he's writing about it. Thank you. And the book is called What It Means to Be a Christian. Thank you, Simone. Thank you again so much for being here. And you can also go to mamasinspirit.com for many more faith-filled podcasts. Please like, subscribe, and share Mamas in Spirit with those you love. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.